Thank you. I feel a lot of pressure. I do not dance. I do not sing. I do not rap. <laughs> I don't do any of that. I talk of more sober topics like health and fitness. Um, it, has all, it has been a pleasure uh, being in spaces with Hanifa, who was kind of like this legendary figure in my house constantly for my kids. I have to say, um, my son and daughter, Selwa and Nisan, who are the two youngest of four children, um, they took away, when I birthed them, all of my poetry came out with them. <laughs> they have put it to good use, yeah. because I actually graduated from Cooperative Arts and Humanities High School here in New Haven with a, um, in a major of creative writing. And I used to do poetry before I had kids. No poetry <laughs> today, like I said. They took it, so I birthed kids and poets all together. <laughs> um, I am going to talk to you a little bit about a forthcoming book that I wrote that will be published um, in the next couple of weeks. And it's called MR40 Method. So I do not have a book, but you have to remember the website. MR40, the number 40, method.com. As long as you remember that, you can keep up with what's going on. So I wrote the MR40 method as, um, in a lot of ways, an acknowledgement of the struggle that my mother has had, had um, throughout her adulthood with health, with diabetes. My mother, um, she, got, she got pregnant with my little sister and she got gestational diabetes and it never went away. And it turned into um, full-blown full blown type 2 diabetes and it forever changed our lives like even before I knew what diabetes was I knew that it was going to it, it was going to change the way that she functioned on a daily basis I learned how to drive when I was 13 years old and I was in Springfield Massachusetts and it was not legal for a 13 year old to drive. <laughs> but I learned how to drive because my mother told me, you need to learn how to drive because if I get sick one day, then I may not be able to get myself to a hospital. And so learning how to drive was not a mark of independence for me. It was a brick of responsibility that Having this skill was literal, it could literally mean life or death for my mother. I remember in particularly, and I talk about this in the introduction to in, in my book, one particular school year, and you know, beginning of the school year, that's when you get all your fly digs, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not aging myself because I use the word fly and digs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally aging myself. <laughs> I remember this particular year, and I was 14 years old, and we were going school shopping, and um, I particularly remember this jean jacket that was covered with rhinestones, and I remember it because salt and pepper was like all the craze, right? I've all, I was born and raised Muslim, and I've always worn a scarf, but I begged my mother for three months for me to cut half of my hair off like pepper. Oh, it took me three months to convince her, but she let me do it. <laughs> And I remember her looking a little dazed, and I asked her, like, are you okay? And she, you know, told me, no, I'm not okay. She's like, I can't really see right now because I forgot to take my insulin before we left home. So we're going to have to go home, and you're going to have to drive. And so I, I remember her sta standing near the platform where the mannequins were, kind of like leaning there, and I had to guide her to the car and I had to drive, and her in her blurry vision told me not to go too fast so that I don't bring attention to the police and not go too slow so I don't bring the attention from the police. She told me to go in a certain direction so just in case she passed out before we got home that I would be near the hospital. Um, and we got home and she took her insulin and fast forward, uh, probably 15 years later, um, I used to own a fitness studio here in New Haven. Uh, and most people know me for teaching boot camp. I've taught outdoor fitness boot camp for 20 years now, <laughs> summer times in New Haven. 
Have you ever come to Bowen Field at 5.30 in the morning and I see the ladies running around? <laughs> um, and I remember her calling me this one day and she tell, told me that she had just gotten out of the hospital, which often happened because my mother had diabetes, but she did not herself know what it meant to have diabetes. <laughs> and she was in the hospital because every few months, she went to the hospital from her doctor's office because she would go to the doctors and the doctor would literally look at her and tell her, I don't even understand why you're like not in a coma right now. <laughs> I don't understand how you're walking around with sugar this high. And they would take her uh, right to the emergency room, call the ambulance, take her to the doctor. And this time when she got out of the hospital, they actually gave her aftercare and they sent her to a rehab and they gave her, um, referred her to a, a few specialists. And she called me and I remember this day so clearly and she was telling me about um, how she was wearing my Balance Fitness shirt to all of her rehab appointments so people wouldn't know that her daughter was a health and fitness expert. I was like, I don't know if I really wanna say that because like, you're actually in a hospital and like, <laughs> a good reputation to have. <laughs> but she was very proud. And so she said to me, she said, my doctor referred me to a nutritionist. Do you think I should go? And I said, you've had diabetes for 25 years. Nobody ever referred you to a nutritionist? And she's like, no. I was like, yeah, you should definitely go. And when I hung up the phone, that was a huge aha moment for me. Because I realized that all of these years when my mom was saying things like, oh, just pass me that Pepsi, everything should make my sugar go up. Or just give me the cake, take the icing off of it. <laughs> we thought she was being irresponsible. We thought that she, we would get angry at her, like you're not taking care of your health. But it, made me realize that she literally did not know how to take care of her health. She was given a prescription, told she had a disease that will forever alter her life, and given a good luck, stop drinking soda. That was the moment that I realized that people really don't know what health, what food, what movement does to their bodies. We have this kind of like folklore in the African American community that diabetes is inherited. You know, when you get older, you get a few extra pounds, you get your glasses, then you go get your needles. <laughs> um, I, will, I want to read you just one excerpt, excerpt from, from the book. Um, when I was 14, even at that age, I didn't understand how a person gets diabetes, but I knew I hated the disease. I knew I never wanted to get diabetes. Like many African-American folk tales, diabetes referred to as sugar by the older generation is thought to be genetic, an unavoidable part of being black, of growing older, almost a rite of passage. You're older, you get wiser, you get grays, and you get sugar. Getting your sugar needles from the doctor was just an indication of age, sort of how you turn 40 and start having to get mammograms. No matter how many times I heard my grandmother had diabetes, my mother has diabetes, so me or one of my siblings are going to get diabetes, I refused to believe it was my fate. Health issues in my family was often a source of discussion. Not how we could avoid them, but rather how we were all playing a game of Russian roulette with diabetes and high blood pressure. Discussing who's going to inherit one thing we knew for sure my mother would leave as an inheritance. Ignorant to the fact that we could refuse the estate tax that came along with having our mother's nose or her well-shaped legs that seemed to always be toned no matter how much weight she lost or gained or her smooth, blemish-free skin from head to toe. With her features and her assets came the tax of all of her health problems. The realization that having health issues was not 
an inherent part of who I was. I like to say that your genetics is the gun, but your lifestyle is the trigger. Yeah. Diabetes is not, and high blood pressure and heart disease, we used to call them the triage of diseases, but now they're referred to as preventable diseases because they are very preventable. On my mother's side, I have a history of diabetes from her mother and her father, from her. My father died at 55 from a stroke induced by high blood pressure, and he didn't even know he had high blood pressure. His mother died from high blood pressure. His sister died from an aneurysm from high blood pressure. These are two things that looms over me, like many other black women, like many other black people. But I think that the realization that we actually have the power to change and not to inherit this tax because often it's not, as they say, it's not that these diseases run in our family. It's just that nobody runs in our family. <laughs> the way that we move, the foods that we choose, the way that we decide to just look at life and manage our stress, all of those things make a huge difference in how we are going to live. My mother died about three years ago. And she died after experiencing every single side effect there is to diabetes. From the start of glaucoma to the 18 months before her death, she had a major stroke. Three months before her death, she uh, had her, limbs, her leg amputated, first her foot, then her leg, and in the end, she was diagnosed with dementia and passed away two weeks later. All of these things are things that are unfortunate. And I really believe that women in particular taking control of our health making sure that we are here for ourselves first. And the most selfless thing that we can do is being completely selfish about our health, about taking time for ourselves, because if we are not here, then our children does not have a mother. Our grandchildren do not have grandmothers. We are the center, not to slight you guys, you're important, <laughs> Absolutely important. But when it comes to the health of families, women play a central role. And I hope that in my work that I empower women to know that they can literally break a generational tax that has been passed down from generation to generation in black families and brown families in particular, and they can decide that this is going to end here. We have a huge uh, surge of, we're gonna break generational poverty, and that's great, but will you be around to enjoy the money? That is the generational curse that I hope that I can help women break, the curse of bad health, the curse of diabetes, the curse of, looking at it as if it is a disease that is unavoidable, that's given to us, and that we can't do anything about it. So we certainly can. Um, 